Thank you, Rusty. Uh, with our invocation, we'll be Kay Shaw. Let's join together in prayer, please. As we gather today as members of Rotary, we pray that we're ever mindful of opportunities to render our service to fellow citizens and to our Midlands community. We pray for strength and guidance for each day as it comes, for each day's duties, for each day's problems. May we be challenged to use our efforts in those areas and on those things on which generations can build with confidence. Father, we ask that you bless our fellowship today and bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies in your service. Amen. Thank you, Kay. With visiting Rotarians and guests, we've got new member Richard Pollard, not his name anymore. Richard. Happy Monday, everybody. Um, I do not believe we have any visiting Rotarians. Do we have one? Do we have a guest? Uh, yes, yes. All right. Is there any visiting Rotarians? Don't believe there are. All right, anybody that has any guests, um, please stand up and introduce your guests. Does it, can anybody uh, come grab this? You got a microphone? Okay, wonderful. Good afternoon. I'm Kim Mitchell with Castle Brothers Heating and Cooling, and I'm honored to have our operations manager and vice president of Vision Air, Cordell Brown, with me today. I'm Andy Shane. I'm the managing editor in Columbia here for the Post and Courier, and I have here my wife, Christy, who is also uh, the uh, public information officer for the Department of Corrections. So, uh, please, uh, I, you know, I always want to sit here and say, please feel sorry for her for being married to me. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon, I'm David Reniker with First Reliance Bank, and I'm pleased to have David Tucker with me here. David's with Tucker Oil, we're glad to have him. I think that's it, visiting guests, and uh, appreciate you being here. Thank you. Hey, David, good to see you. Um, next on the agenda is Health and Happiness with Wayne Cannon. You know, Rusty does a great job playing the piano for us every week, and the opera's not here, but we ought to give a big round of applause for all the things we've Over the years, I've asked more volunteers, but nobody volunteered to do that but him. But, so we, we should be really thankful for that. Well, we have a few inf uh, information, a little information about some of the members. Debbie had a so shoulder surgery. And she's doing quite well in getting over that. Last Friday, she had that. Uh, don't forget the Alzheimer's budget. We're running a little bit behind. We normally do uh, uh, contribute about $6,000 a year, but due to the COVID and membership attendance, as well as the fact that we didn't meet for a few weeks there, we are running a bit behind. But you know, when you talk about Alzheimer's, my mother-in-law, in her later stages of life, had uh, Alzheimer's, and my wife. This is, this is a, you know, some of the story you hear bad, but this was a, this was a good one. She was uh, she couldn't remember a phone number, so she bought her one of those phones that had where you bash one button and it dials it. And so she was instructing her about how to use this phone, and she says, you know, you just hit this button here, and and, and, and it'll get me up if you do that. And she says, okay, let's practice now. And so she says. Pick up the phone, and my mother-in-law picks up the whole phone, holds it over her head, and she says, "No, no, just the receiver." She says, "Well, you said pick up the phone," <laughs> and so you get some funny responses from that. And, uh, uh, Charles Duval, who was not a member of this club, but was an uh, Episcopal bishop, died this past week. He was uh, a frequent member, uh, not a, a frequent visitor for the club, and had some. Uh, people who were in the club and anyway, he passed away for those who knew him. Also remember October 19th, we got the purple finger. That's with uh, wear purple. I don't got anything purple. I don't know if I have to borrow from my wife, I reckon. 
Anybody? Now wear purple shirts? Yeah. Huh? Well, we didn't do. I don't know. Okay, anyway, I've got a purple for, for that. For the... Anybody know what that's all about? Polio, that's right. October the 24th is Polio World Polio Day. And of course, uh, we as Rotarians are real active in that. Uh, Glenn Matthews' wife, who had a go kart accident, Melanie is recovering from that real nicely now, and she's doing much better. She did have uh, quite a uh, issue with that. She fell, well, hit her head, and that's never good. So anyway, she's recovering quite nicely. So if you see Glenn, he was here just a second ago. Oh, tell him. Right. And then uh, real quick uh, for those I know should be disappointed. Uh, do y'all bear with me now? I, I, I gave Rotary Health and Happiness a few weeks ago. And at that time we had an announcement about the magazine. So everybody that was not here for that meeting, I want you to stand up. Come on, people. I, Melbourne, stand up. I know you weren't here. Yeah, I know the rest of you. Anybody wasn't here for that meeting? No, stay standing. Stay standing. I tell you to sit. You can't stand up, Dottie. All right. That's all it was. All right. If anybody can tell me what the change of the magazine was, I'll give you a present. You told I told you. Well, that don't count. Sit down. <laughs> anybody else know? He knows. What was it? <laughs> all right. The Rotarian was called the Rotarian magazine for how long? Anybody know the answer to that? No. 114 years this magazine was called Rotarian. Two months ago they changed it to Rotary. And there ain't nobody in this club noticed. <laughs> except me. And that's because I read it. And I don't think we're you know, it says 85% of the people are not the things I read. 85% of the Rotarians actually read this magazine. I said, well, 15% are in our club. <laughs> so, you, know, you, you really need to read it. It's great. There's an article in the last one that just came out. We got it last week. It's October's. It gives, it gives a long history of the, of the relationship of Rotary and the United Nations. Now, I know the United Nations is controversial, but they do a lot of good things for the health care of the world. And that's the part that the Rotary Club is involved in, is the health of the world. And so, read that one. It, it, it'll take you about five minutes to read it. It might take you, well, some of it might take ten. But anyway, you know, read, read, read that part about the involvement of Rotary International in the World Health Organization and how Rotary has helped health throughout the world for the past, we became involved in 1920. But this is the 75th anniversary of the United Nations and the Rotary Club is very active in, in the health care that. If you read the Rotary Magazine, you'd know that. Real quick, I've got two quick points of history that I found, you know, we, I, I always knew that, that Benjamin Tillman, who was governor of South Carolina, had the nickname Pitchfork Bill, Pitchfork Ben Tillman. And he was governor from 1890 to 94. And he was also our U.S. Senator from 1895 to 1918. And he, he, uh, got the name, and I never knew why until I read this. He said when he was running for the Senate, he said if he won, he would take a pitchfork and stick it in the governor over Cleveland's ribs. And so that's how he got the name. I never, I knew it, it was pitchfork then, but I never knew why. That didn't work much, but it's funny. All right, I got some other history things, but I'll save those for next time which might be sooner than you want. <laughs> Thank you, Wade.
Wayne, always entertaining and educational. Uh, also, in a recent magazine, y'all may have noticed our own member, William Starrett, was on the front cover. His image was of the Columbia Metropolitan Magazine. And that was quite fascinating. So if you've got that magazine, do look at it and look in detail and then look at it specifically at all the little details and how it encompasses his lifetime. It's pretty fascinating. It's a great article, too. All right, uh, next, I do want everybody to recognize the Blue Buckets. Please put some money in there. As Wayne mentioned earlier, we do, we are behind on that, and you can make a tax deductible contribution to the CART Fund. Uh, next on the agenda is Andy Shane. He's coming up to chat. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon at this point. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you may or may not know, I am heading up the Salvation Army um, uh, Kettle uh, campaign this this uh, this uh, season for the Rotary. Um, I'm doing it a bit more reversing roles uh, with uh, Chase in my office. So, uh, so uh, again, I guess uh, we uh, we're teaming up uh, to help help run that. So, uh, I just wanted to give a little bit of a very quick update because it's October, and usually this is about the time when we start uh, putting things together for it. A couple of very quick announcements. Number one. Um, locations haven't been um, um, set up quite yet. I'm being told it'll be a couple more weeks until we kind of solidify that. But the word is is that, uh, first of all, uh, both greens, uh, the, the old one on assembly and the new one on Garner's Ferry, are very much in play. So uh, my understanding is that that'll be the main locations that we'll uh, be doing our bell ringing at uh, this season. Um, and what I wanted to find out also is to get folks to help um, be day captains. Uh, for those days that so we do do, uh, you know, obviously we need people to help shepherd uh, to get people together for those days. So we, uh, we fill our shifts. And a couple of suggestions I always have about filling those shifts is that if you can, you know, obviously the companies that you work at or, or the businesses you own, uh, to maybe put together a team of people from, from your companies or from your businesses and do that. And also a reminder to all of your, uh, if you have your, um, students in your home who need to get service hours for either for church or for school, that it's also a good opportunity to to, uh, to maybe set something up for that. So of course, if you want to put a teenager in front of the liquor store ringing a bell, um, <laughs> it's not a bad idea, probably some good lessons to be learned there, but in all seriousness, um, obviously looking to try to get those shifts filled, especially of course during this time when um, obviously some people don't want to be out uh, as much. So I'll have some more information as we, as we uh, obviously I get, I get more from the Salvation Army about things and, and sign, obviously at the sign up, uh, ready to go uh, when I do know more. But in the meantime, um, please tell me if you can see me after maybe the meeting, if you want to be a day captain, and if not, Cynthia's going to put something on the uh, um, up on the newsletter she sends out, and it'll have my email address, so please send me a note uh, that you'd be interested in doing that. I could use the help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. Uh, we'll be keeping all that in mind, having day captains, but uh, our guest speaker is not allowed to bring people who need community service out. <laughs> so we know that to be a fact. Okay, uh, next on the agenda is Cynthia Jobs. Cynthia? Purple is not my color. But it's going to be everybody's color next Monday, right? Yes. yes. So, um, as we were already informed, World Polio Day is Saturday, October 24th, and we are going to participate in a district-wide challenge next Monday. And what that is, and I've tried to make it super simple for us all, is you guys show up dressed up in as much purple as you can, and I will take pictures and video, and we will post it, and hopefully we win the award. All we're trying to do is get awareness because there's two countries left in the entire world that we need to eradicate it in, and it's a political endeavor right now. So we need your support. Share it. Show up next Monday in purple. Share everything that you can on your social media about polio awareness and try to get donations, but more than anything, try to get people engaged and to know that polio is still there. If you ask most people my age in this country, they will tell you it's already eradicated, uh, which is a problem. So let's go ahead and focus on it, and I will be in this beautiful wig next week. So please join me. Thank you, Cynthia. We look forward to seeing you again in that wig uh, next week. I will be wearing a purple tie of some type. 
I encourage all of you all, as she said, bring in purple next Monday. We will be videotaping. We will also be doing, on top of the national anthem, in addition to the national anthem next week, we'll be reciting the four-way test, because she'll be videotaping us all in purple doing that. And as a practice for that, we're going to do that at the end of this meeting. Instead of seeing, because Rusty had to leave, and Audrey's not here, we're going to recite the four-way test. I know I'm blocking all of it for most of you, but uh, we will have to uh, bone up on the four-way test this afternoon and then again next Monday, just so you all know. Uh, do wear your masks, as uh, we do have an ordinance here. We want everybody to be comfortable. When you're finished eating and drinking, put your mask on. I see lots of you here with your rotary mask. That's fantastic. Um, as a reminder, Keith Hudson and Jim Hudson Automotive did provide some seat money for those masks. We want to appreciate them for doing that. They are available out front, most meet every meeting, and they're also available to get if you talk to Brad. They'll mail one to you, or five, however many you'd like, for $10 contributions to the Rotary Club. And that's all going to help us pay for our food packing event, which is going to be here on Saturday, December 5th. It's going to be at 9 o'clock. You can bring family members to attend and help with the food packing event as well. They do need to be over the age of 18 for the food packing event. So uh, please plan to be here, um, bring friends, and it will be on Saturday, December 5th at 9 o'clock. Um, but do get as many masks as you can between now and then. Membership, as we've talked about, is always essential. We have some prospective members here today. Um, we have another Discover Rotary meeting on Monday, November 2nd. Uh, that will be here at 11.30. Please bring prospective members to uh, come and learn more about Rotary and why it's important to join and everything that there is uh, when they do join. Um, you all have all received your fourth quarter invoices. Please pay them as soon as possible. Next Monday after the 19th, uh, on Monday the 19th after that meeting, we're going to have a board meeting and we'll be talking about um, invoices and those folks who have their still due um, to be paid. So try to get those paid at least by next Monday. But that is an announcement I don't think the board knows. So the board that's here today, we have a board meeting next Monday the 19th, immediately following this meeting. We're also going to invite all past presidents to attend that meeting. So there's a little bit of a co-meeting going on with past presidents and the current board. That will be next Monday the 19th after this meeting. Um, right now we do have a couple of minutes. So we're going to take a couple of minutes, two minutes each, or two minutes now for 30 seconds each to introduce yourselves to your table mates. 30 seconds, go.
So. All right, hope y'all know each other a little bit better now. Um, next is our main speaker, and to introduce our speaker today is Billy Canty. Morning or afternoon, everybody. Oh, I have the pleasure today of introducing our speaker, Brian Sterling. Uh, Brian and I met in, I guess, 1993 in law school, so I've known him for quite a while. And just probably so I don't embarrass either one of us, I'm going to go by his bio instead of uh, starting back up. Um, uh, Brian, <laughs> Brian Sterling is the director of the South Carolina Department of Corrections. Uh, he was confirmed as a director uh, by the South Carolina Senate in February 19, 2014. He has a staff of 5,000. Sterling is also responsible for roughly 17,500 inmates currently serving time in one of the 21 penal institutes across the state. Upon assuming office, uh, Sterling got in, the, uh, the agency had it undergone officer shortages and media scrutiny, and under his leadership, the agency has closed six institutions. The inmate population has declined due to a reduction in the recidivism, recidivism rates, uh, sentencing reform, successful programs, and services within the institution. Brian's settled and also settled a decade-old mental health lawsuit that plagued the agency and its leadership. In 2016, he received the Stephen G. Morris and Nelson Mullen Social Justice Award from the Columbia Urban League and the William D. Leake Award of Excellence. Uh, prior, to, prior to joining the uh, correctional system, uh, Brian served as a director, uh, attorney general for nearly six years, and most recently served as Nikki Haley's chief of staff from 2012 to 2013, during which he oversaw management of the governor's cabinet and office of executive policies and programs. Uh, Brian graduated from the University of South Carolina in 1991 and then graduated from the University of Law School in 1996. Um, on a personal note, Brian is married and has twins, a boy and a girl. So I give you this give a warm and reverent welcome to Brian Sterling. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Andy, thank you for inviting me. Uh, Mason and Billy have known you all for a long time. Thank you for. Um, he abbreviated uh, <laughs> bio. I appreciate that. Uh, and Andy said that sometimes he has to apologize, uh, or his wife has to apologize, saying I'm married to Andy Shane. I think her hardest job is actually being the, uh, the communications director of the Department of Corrections, because with social media and inmate cell phones, it, uh, it just doesn't stop. It is, it is constant uh, on social media and with the media. And when Andy asked me um, to speak, I said, "How? You know, what do you want me to speak about?" And uh, he said about 20 minutes. <laughs> so, I'll speak for about 20 minutes. Uh, anyways, uh, I'm going to talk about reentry, jobs uh, inside the facility, cell phones, COVID, and um, some other things. Department of Corrections actually we closed seven institutions. A lot of people don't know, but the President's First Step Act was based on what we did in South Carolina in 2010 um, with sentencing reform. And um, We've dropped the population. When I took over, it was about 22,000 folks who were incarcerated. Now we're barely over 16,000 and we'll be under 16,000 shortly. And why is that? One of my things I put on uh, Twitter, attacked every time I put something on Twitter pretty viciously by some folks, but anyways, um, 85, 5, and you, what, what does that mean? Well, 85% of the folks that come to the Department of Corrections are out in under five years and they're back out amongst you. So don't we want them better than when we came in? And I think everybody in South Carolina can agree that we do. You can save a lot of tax dollars, you can make the community safer, but you can actually change uh, a family, a generation, or generations of folks. So um, a little secret that, no offense to the, our friends in the media, Andy, but they don't want to report good news uh, with the um, Department of Corrections, is that we have the lowest recidivism rate in the country. What is the recidivism rate? coming back to prison within 30 years. We're actually tied with, uh, with Virginia. Why is that? Well, when I took over, I don't know if you all remember the old bus stop there on, uh, on uh, Harden Street. I went down one morning about 3 o'clock to see what we were doing for because um, I like to see things. It drives my staff crazy, especially with over 5,000 uh, employees. But, um, I like to see what we're doing. So I showed up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I was appalled at what I saw. 
We were letting men and women out. They were still in their prison uniforms, but we just took a strike off. So technically, they weren't in prison uniforms anymore. Prostitutes and drug dealers were there. Um, they were not really given a chance. I mean, they were like, immediately victims, and you'd say, okay, you're leaving prison. Do you have any money? Well, no, but you know, if you throw this, this dope for me or sling this dope for me tomorrow, I'll give you this stuff today. Uh, prostitutes were doing the same thing. So I called Sheriff Lott, and I got Sheriff Lott folks there. One thing that concerned me uh, was the number of students coming down from Allen and Benedict. It was Halloween, so I was a little surprised going through Five Points. It's been a long time since I've been Five Points um, for any kind, anything kind of social late at night. And I was just shocked at the number of students. And then we had these folks that just left prison. So literally, if you can picture Hardin Gervais, there's a streaming group of um, young ladies walking back to Benedict and Allen. And then all these people who just left prison, I mean, that was a cocktail for a disaster. So one of the things that we did and saved some money was we said, if you get picked up by your family members trying again to get them connected with family members, you can leave the day that you're allowed to leave. If you can't, you've got to take the bus and you've got to wait a couple days and we're not going to let you go to this bus stop that was there. It's no longer there on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, because that was a large portion of people coming back and forth. Guess what? Everybody took their own. Took the bus. I mean, everybody got picked up by family members, and that started the process. One of the things, and I went back and said, "Hey, we've got to have a better reentry process. What we want to do is we want to have these folks learn these skills and um, be able to, you know, the whole fish teaching someone the fish thing, and get that GED, get that high school diploma, get that welding certificate, get that truck driving certificate." So I went to um, then Governor Haley at the time. And I said, "Hey." Um, what I'd like to do is ask for this money for reentry efforts. So we started this reentry program, Man Correctional, which is here in Columbia. And it's a couple month program, six month program, where they go through and they learn these skills. It's simple things like explaining incarceration, because we all know, especially Castle Brothers, I'm sure y'all do um, do background checks. I hope you do, because you serve as my house. So she's shaking her head yes, because um, that would be awkward. Um, so um, anyways, how do you explain incarceration? You, know, you want to sit down with the person and you want to bring it up yourself. You want to proactively say, you know what, I made some bad decisions. I don't like to call them mistakes. I think a mistake is when you didn't mean to do something and something happens. Folks that end up in prison, they make choices. They make choices to commit crimes. But they can also make a choice that gives them control to make a choice to better their lives, to turn their lives around. So um, one of the things we teach them is, hey, you know, say I went to prison, but here's what I did. You know, I got involved in this program. I was in a character institution, or I became an inmate worker. I got my GED, or I did this, that, and the other. Anger management, spousal abuse, all this other stuff. I went through all these classes, and we put that on our website, so you can check to see what I did. And we'll tell folks that are with employers in the room, if you're looking to hire and you're desperate to hire, please hire someone who's leaving prison. You can not only change that person's life, you can change their children's life, you can change their family's life. Um, and there's money out there to do it, there's training credits, there's bonding and things of that nature. We notice and watch what we do is we follow what's going on in the state with the ports. So, you know, super tankers, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the race that we're having with other ports across the um, the East Coast, the super tankers coming across. Well, guess, guess what a big need is, and anybody that's driven from Charleston to Columbia anytime soon knows this, trucking, warehousing, um, asphalt, roads. So we have, uh, we teach warehousing. We've bought simulators to teach people how to um, drive trucks. We have um, asphalt machines that we use on, um, you know, to teach how to do asphalt. But one problem, the one thing that we need our legislators to do is change the um, liability statute. Because if you hire someone who has a criminal background and they're a truck driver, guess what's going to come in in court? I know Glenn probably knows this, but that history, regardless of what it is, it could not be a, a driving offense, it could be another offense, but it's going to come into court and the jury's going to hear that. So a lot of insurance companies, I don't blame them, are not going to hire someone because of that. I don't think that should be the fact. I don't think that should be the case. I think if it had to do with, um, with driving, it should come in, depending on what the judge rules on the rules of evidence. But if it didn't, should that really come in? And should we really be penalizing people who made that um, choice before and stopping them from getting a job? One of the other things I noticed when I came in was our, um, our hiring. We hadn't had a raise in 10 years um, back in 2013. And when Governor Haley, she brought me in her office, I was her chief of staff. 
sat me down and said, you know, I want you to take over the Department of Corrections. And I immediately asked her what I did to make her mad. <laughs> um, but she said, you know, they have um, they have a lot of problems with um, with security staffing. We've had some institutions, some level three or maximum security prisons, that have had with a thousand folks incarcerated there, ten people show up to work for a shift. Um, and somebody remarked recently that my hair has gotten grayer. Well, that'd be a pretty good reason for that because we know we're operating in a very dangerous environment. We're paying overtime now. We do, we have increased the salaries almost done. They were about $26,000, $27,000. Now the average, I think, is about $34,000. That doesn't include overtime. With overtime, they're well into their $40,000, which, you know, if you live in Lee County and there's not a lot of jobs and you don't want to commute to Columbia, you don't want to um, commute to Florence or somewhere like that, you can make a, a good living for your family um, on that amount of money. Um, we're trying to do spot bonuses to bring people in. We're trying to develop uh, leadership and things of that nature. But we were in a pretty big hole. We're still in a pretty big hole, but with our numbers coming down, it is helping, but we're not where we need to be. The other thing I'd say that we're doing is we're overclassifying people. So, for example, um, Bernie Madoff, he goes to federal prison. He's basically at a work camp up in, um, up in North Carolina. If he came to the South Carolina Department of Corrections, he'd be at a level three prison because of the amount of time that he's doing, which is a maximum security prison, which doesn't make any sense because you have someone like that, and then you have someone that's a career criminal who's a gang member and this, that, and the other, and they may be roommates. That's just a very dangerous, very dangerous cocktail. One thing, funny thing I'll tell you about Bernie Maybank, and you can Google it because I've, um, I've, I've done that. He cornered the market on hot chocolate at the prison and then sold it for double the amount. Uh, made off did that. You said Maybank. No, Maybank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm projecting, Bernie. I apologize. <laughs> um, maybe if he had you for an attorney, he wouldn't be, uh, be in federal prison right now. Um, anyways, he doubled that number. Um, so, the other thing is, and I don't have my phone, my phone's over there, but you, everybody's heard me talk about, um, about phones um, and how dangerous they are. Uh, Phones are, and I talk with a, he's a current sheriff, he used to be in a state law enforcement, but they are the most dangerous thing that an inmate can have. I can't tell you the number of times and the number of problems that have happened because of phones. A month or two ago, Sheriff Lawton had a press conference, there were some drive-by shootings in Columbia. It was, it was orchestrated by someone that was at the Department of Corrections. There's uh, our Officer Johnson, who is a contraband um, lieutenant or captain over at, uh, at Lee Correctional. There was a hit put out on him. They went to his house in Sumter, he's an Air Force veteran, and it was so sophisticated, uh, anybody that knows guns knows that 38s, they don't have shell casings come out, that they used um, a 38, so there'd be no shell casings. That was orchestrated because he was doing such a good job of keeping uh, the, uh, the phones and, and other contraband out of the Department of Corrections. We've got drones that are coordinated bringing um, drugs and other things in. We've got officers who are um, compromised because of, I can't tell you the number of investigations we have that are directly related to cell phones. I want these folks to talk to their family members, I want them to communicate, but I want to know what they're saying for safety. So we did um, tablets where they can talk a little bit more um, to their family members and they can have them their, their cells so they can have some privacy, but we still hear what's going on. We've tried and tried, Senator Graham has introduced a bill in D.C. with other senators to allow us to block that signal. We've got um, a, a um, system that we, that works some of the time and it does not. I know Jamie works 100% of the time. Um, I got a call today from someone that I used to work with who said that her, um, her aunt was assaulted years ago, kidnapped and raped and assaulted. And that person that did that has written her a letter because he found her information on the internet, a legal cell phone, and he's called her several times. Uh, it's just very, very dangerous. I want them to communicate, but those cell phones need to um, they need to be jammed. And the FCC and the cell phone industry has said that they want to come to the table, they want to help. Um, and I'm all for that. But I just think jamming works. If there's something else that works, let us know. We can do it. But um, it's just very dangerous. COVID. So that's been a big topic that everybody's seen. That's why we're all wearing the masks. I was very concerned when COVID first came out because I knew there was no way for us to distance in the institutions. There's just no way. We have communal living in some of our institutions like Tiger River. We got hit early this year pretty hard. One of the things that's a problem with Tiger River is uh, back 20, 30 years ago, they built the prison, but they decided to save money by not putting in toilets. Um, 
in the cell. So they all have to go to the communal cell, which at night, you know, we lock them down at night and put them behind lock and key and turn the key. Problem is when they have to go to the bathroom, you know, kind of let them out um, and go. And they had uh, a lot of, I, guess I would say a lot of interactions, so it stopped or it spread at Tiger River. Now we have Broad River where there's a problem, which is right here in Columbia. We got um, 2,272 folks who we know of have um, tested positive for COVID. And uh, currently 462 still have it. We've had 31 deaths. Most of the deaths are like the nursing homes. They're older folks with comorbidities. One of the problems we had at Broad River is when it got in there, that's where we had, because we could deliver a lot of medical services at Broad River. We had um, a lot of cancer patients and diabetics and things of that nature, so um, it really hit that institution hard. We've had almost 500 officers test positive. We tested on the folks who are incarcerated, the officers, they have to get tested themselves. We've had uh, currently 52 that we know of and two of them have passed. We don't know if they got um, COVID at the institution or not. Some of them, one of them we don't think so, the other one we're, we're not sure. But it is um, very dangerous and very damaging to the institutions it's taken a lot because we've got to take people out to the hospital we take people out to the hospital we have to take people from the institution and bring them to the, um, the hospital so we make sure that we have enough officers there to keep the, the public safe we give them masks we uh, test one of the issues and one of the good things we're having now is everybody's seeing is the quicker we can test and the quicker we can get the results back the better we are to able to separate those early on it was taking two weeks so we have um, inmate X who would get tested for it, we would know for two weeks and if we try to isolate that inmate, but you know, there's only so much we can do inside the institution. Staff is giving masks. They are also giving um, a test on the way in. I take a test. If you've been around anybody, if you've gone to a hot spot, this, that, and the other, um, we're putting ionizers in. One of the things that um, we saw at Kirkland Correctional here in Columbia was we stopped jumping from cell to cell. So the theory that we had, I had, was, you know, for example, say in, in the dorm, there'd be cell number one would get it, and then just say cell number 14 would get it. And we're like, these people didn't come anywhere close to each other. Yes, they were served food, but they didn't come anywhere close to each other. And I started reading about what was going on in New York with the restaurants and things of that nature. So if your buyer return, it would travel through the return and, and throw it basically over everybody. So I talked to um, Mr. Best here in Columbia. He, he does some work with Boeing. He does, um, I'm sure you all know him. He does, um, the, the, I think, the grills. And I asked him about it um, and his wife. And he convinced me that one thing that it was doing was moving around the air conditioning systems. He also convinced me that we could not put filters up because the air conditioning systems are very, very old. Very old, so they break all the time. So if we put a filter up, it would uh, put the air through, but then it would probably hurt them. The system and kill the system and we have to be repairing systems left and right so basically what these ionizers do and i joked about this before usc won the vanderbilt game but they do what usc's defense can't do which is tackle um, <laughs> <laughs> um tackle the virus so basically they tackle the virus and they they put it to the ground and we'll be installing those by december we're going to use canteen funds for that but we're hoping to get um, cares act money to pay for that because it's, it's about a million dollars. Some of our partnerships, MUSC has been amazing. They've helped us with testing. They've helped us with our, um, our staff testing. They've helped us with inmate testing. National Guard has come in and they've done the twice a day checks and the checks of temperature, the checks of oxygen level and things of that nature because we just don't have the medical staff. And we're hurting for nurses. I think everybody is, but we are severely hurting for nurses because we're not competitive in our pay. Asked the General Assembly for money uh, for that, about $12 million to be competitive. I think Lexington Hospital pays about 65000 I think we're at 40000 So you can go work at Lexington Hospital for sixty-five, dollars or you can go work at the Department of Corrections for 40000 And I understand that, so we're, we're losing people. One thing I didn't mention with our um, returning citizens, <clears throat> we have now at medium security and maximum security, they go through programs. We're copying a program that we started about a year ago from Ohio where folks are leaving maximum security and that means they've been in prison for a very long time. They're not supposed to know how to use a cell phone and things of that nature. They probably do because of what I've talked about, but they go through a two-year program also. Um, so we're trying to do as much testing as we can. We've got an application for employees. So if they've been close to someone that has been 
touched by this virus, they will know that they scan in and you can come in or you can't come in. So we're literally doing everything we can to try to um, help. If you want to help, one of the things you can do is soap, hand sanitizer, and things of that nature. That would be tremendous to help the institutions. We try to get those out. I think we do a good job with that. The biggest thing you can do to help, though, is if you want to volunteer, once this is over, we're not letting volunteers in. We're not letting families in. If you want to volunteer inside the institution, if you have a skill, um, please come in. If you, you know, just simple math, reading, writing, things of that nature are tremendous for these folks. Hiring, if you have a company, and we train on every single thing um, that you can think of out there, please consider hiring someone that is leaving prison. You can get bonded, you can get tax credits for it, but these folks are desperate to work. They're desperate to do the job. I can't tell you the number of times I'll get a call from someone, and we've got major corporations in South Carolina that have, that have started hiring our folks um, because they were so desperate to, for workers. I can't tell you the number of times I've got a call from someone saying, you know what? That person that we hired that left um, prison a couple months ago, they're our best worker and we want more. Because they're just desperate and they're we, we do the training for you. So if you have something that's a need and you can't find anybody to do it, please let us know and we'll start a training program. Just like we've done with the trucking industry, just like we've done with welding, just like we've done with warehousing, just like we've done with the people that are building the roads. You know, we obviously know that there are some jobs that people for various reasons can't hire, and we understand that, but if there are jobs out there that you can hire for, please let us know. And it's clearly working, because people are not coming back um, to, the, to prison. One of the last things I want to talk about is, um, is Twitter and the, uh, the public perception. If you follow me on Twitter, uh, Christy wrote this down for me, but you can see my fan club. Just over the last couple weeks, I've been called Hitler, and um, said I run um, Nazi death camps. And, um, pretty offensive. Uh, it's very offensive. Um, and we're doing everything we can with everything we have available, and we're trying to figure out how to stop COVID, how to stop um, some of the violence, things of that nature. And as I would say, and I've said before publicly, and I've told your paper this, Andy, you know, we don't always get it right. But when we don't, we'll apologize, but we're trying everything. If you're going to be a critic, that's fine, be a critic, but don't just come with criticism. Please come with suggestions. Please come and say, hey, have you thought of this, or why don't you do this? We've done it in the mental health case that um, I was nominated by Governor Haley, and I took over October 1st, 2013, and we got a mental health lawsuit, or settlement, or not settlement, but a uh, lawsuit, and the judgment was that January, which was saying we were treating people unconstitutionally. And I asked my staff, they came in and said, we can fight this, we can fight this. And one thing I learned working with uh, Governor McMaster in the Attorney General's office was that if there is a solution, you come up with a solution, you should always sit down with someone and try to figure it out. So we sat down and we came up with a settlement. We're not there yet, but we're trying to get there. Hepatitis C, that was spreading throughout the prisons and it was going outside. So one of the things we did was we sat down, we mediated that case, and we got money from the General Assembly to treat hepatitis C inside our, our facilities. Um, it's always good to reach out and, and try to um, settle a case if you can, if it's the right thing to do. If it's not and you want to fight it, then um, go ahead and fight it. I'm happy to answer any questions that y'all might have. I know John Monk's not here, so I'm going to get that John Monk question that he always ask people. Yes, sir? So I understand that. So there are some jobs, like I said, that he's, he's hired ex inmates before, which I appreciate. But if they don't, if you have contracts with the federal government or things of that nature, they they won't let you in. Um, so what we'd ask is if you do have a need where those limitations aren't there, that you would look at, at doing that or find other things where they don't have to do that. Um, and that's what we'd ask. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your time here today. Um, one of the concerns I've noticed when. The, all of the news stories started coming in with COVID was that there was a lot of inmates being left unsupervised for long periods of time. Um, it's a news article, so uh, my <laughs> my concern with that is if there's 
um, an issue with job force and then you know COVID happened and there's even less people what do you need from the state or from the federal government to help fill those gaps so we don't have large amounts of people unsupervised or large groups of inmates supervised by one person because that's not so we definitely have large amounts of inmates supervised by one person I can tell you that they're not unsupervised we find a way with overtime and things of that nature that would just be uh, like a Lord of the Flies situation it would just be not good. One of the things we did recently was we um, hired a private security firm to come and start working for us uh, and they're going to be doing duties that our folks can then be pushed inside. They can be, they can be when we send someone to a, a outside facility we'll have a contact and non-contact officer. Contact officer will not have a weapon obviously for obvious reasons. Uh, the non-contact uh, would uh, for security reasons so we're hiring them to help us with um, with outside, we're hiring them to do rover, front gate, and things of that nature. So we started that a couple months ago. One thing you should know is whenever we try to do anything, and I know Bernie knows this, um, we have to get permission. For us to spend money, there's a process, and we have to get permission from Joint Bond Review and uh, the old Budget Control Board and things of that nature. So if we do a contract, it has to go through the state procurement, and I know Hal knows this too, and anybody else that does procurement stuff. It's not like we can turn on a dime and, and spend the money. So some of this takes a little bit longer than I'd like, and I'm not very patient with some of this stuff. So we do sometimes have one officer in a dorm uh, with um, 200 or 300 inmates, which, you know, if you're that officer and you see something doing something wrong, what are you going to do? You know, ultimately, we'd like two, three, or four people. In some of the northern states, we are unionized, and their officers make a million dollars, I mean, um, a thousand or a hundred thousand dollars a year, they do have all that. But we just, you know, we don't have that. So we're trying to, try to supplement with, with overtime. The overtime numbers, I don't have the specific amount, but what we pay, if we divide by the number of officers, it, it is up um, higher than the number So I share your concern. I have a question from the Facebook Live, which has never happened before. Do you want to ask that? Sure, oh. sure. Yeah. <laughs> There's a person named Trish Strange from a Rotary in Tennessee asking, um, she has a nonprofit who mentors kids in the inner city. Ex-prisoners would be great counselors with troubled kids. Does the prison offer courses on how to be a counselor? So yes, we actually have. I hired a former gang leader out of. Um, thanks, Trish, for the question. Um, I hired a former gang leader out of Massachusetts, and they've got a program at Lee where they bring a bunch of um, gang members together, and they not only do it inside, but um, they do it on the outside. So they go around to schools and talk about decisions that they've made. And this one guy, I don't know how he um, got his sentence shortened, but he literally has turned his life around. He was the head gang um, in the Massachusetts Department of Corrections. He's turned his life around, and he's working with other gang members to make sure that they uh, they don't do that. But he, he, she can call probably Tony Parker, who's a director and a friend of mine up in Tennessee, and he's a great director. He's actually president of the American Correctional Association. And I'm sure someone in his office would be more than happy to connect with someone in Tennessee um, to turn that around. Perfect. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Brian, is the, the, I'm assuming the telephone issue is not unique to South Carolina. It's not. Charles Manson had a telephone. And that should scare everybody. Yeah. What, what's, the other, what's the other side of that argument of why it's so difficult to deal with? Um, well, one of them is bleed over. And we did a test here in the Department of Justice where, you know, the blocking would bleed over. Not all prisons, like most prisons in South Carolina are rural or there's nothing really around. Some prisons are um, closer. They'll give you the Baltimore City Jail example, and um, you know they'll say, okay, it's right next to the sidewalk, so if there's a 911 call. I was on the phone with our head of security who was out of state. Sherry Lyden was the judge Lyden, and I was the U.S. attorney at the time. And I stopped before I walked in, because we have this system that helps us identify where some of the phones are. Unfortunately, sometimes we don't have the staff to go in and actually get the phone safely in some of our institutions and we put a little microchip in there and changed it. You can't buy this system. No one will sell it to you because it's against them. The feds can do it. Federal prisons can do it. That's what the law says, but states cannot. So we got permission. I was deputized as a special marshal for a period of time. Got the big hat. Um, and uh, so anyways, I literally was on the phone with him and I said, I'm going in and I started talking to him and I took one step into the, um, the door and my phone completely shut off. It literally worked one step away. So I think that's a red herring. I think one of the issues that cell phone companies have, and they haven't told me this, we're probably okay with prisons, but what's next? Cars, movie theaters, churches, schools, what's next? And that's a big revenue source for them. 
So I think that's their concern. It, it is a public safety, it, it truly is a public safety matter. I want them to communicate, I wouldn't have done the tablet program that gives them you know, more ability to talk to their family members, but um, I just think it's just so dangerous. So, um, yes ma'am. Um, thank you for coming today. I want to commend your employees. Um, I don't know if you've put anything in place or not, but one of my best friends is your best yes, friend assistant. Me, yes. And they take their job seriously. And she I've does. not seen her since March because she doesn't want to take a chance on bringing anything outside or taking anything inside. So I want to commend you and your employees for doing that. Yeah, Dane is, um, I call Dane Ritter, Radar O'Reilly. If anybody remembers my master remembers that, because I'll be like, hey, I need this, and it will show up on my desk. So Dane does a moment. No questions, Andy? It's a free shot. <laughs> Thank you. Brian, we appreciate you being here today. We appreciate all that you're doing to keep us safe and the inmates safe too. Here's a little thank you from the Lord. Thank you. Um, President elect Catherine Davis could not be here today. She wanted me to let you all know that Robert Bo. Cofield, he's the CEO of Palmetto Prisma, Richland. So he'll be here and he'll be our speaker next week. That'll be pretty interesting. And, and like I mentioned earlier, we are now going to recite the four-way test before we uh, adjourn. So let's all rise and give the four-way test together. I'll use the microphone and lead us. <coughs> yeah.